Okay, so welcome to this uh, fifth seminar of the Brussels Institute of Advanced Studies. And uh, so we are continuing this uh, interesting journey towards uh, uh, sustainable robotics. So today we will have uh, three speakers. So the first speaker is uh, Professor Yael Edan from the um, uh, ben Gurion University of Negev. Uh, Yael Edan is a professor of industrial engineering uh, and uh, she's involved in many fields of robotics. Uh, 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 for example, in uh, uh, we saw in the previous forum uh, some application in agriculture, and uh, today we will see other interesting applications. The second speaker will be the Professor Ber Barry Lennox, uh, that I will uh, introduce uh, later on, and the third speaker is uh, Dr. Michel Jupan de Shore. So let's start with the first speaker, and uh, Yael, the floor is yours, is yours. Thank you very much, Luha. Uh, I'll present our work on social assistive robotics in elder care. Actually, I got to social robotics uh, from my agriculture robotics work. After dealing a long time in agriculture robots and developing agriculture robots, realized that there will not be, at least to my thinking, an autonomous robot, a totally autonomous robot. And I started to try and think, how can you integrate uh, humans and have human robot collaboration. I did a lot of modeling on human robot collaboration in agriculture uh, and then started interacting with our faculty that are working in human factors uh, and also seeing what are the problems uh, in getting the human in the loop and there are many, many problems. So we focused on elder care at an excellent timing just before COVID so it was very, very relevant and gave a big boost to our uh, research. Uh, there's a huge elder care gap. The population is growing in very intensively on one hand, and there's a lack of caregivers and healthcare professionals on the other hand, and this gives the need really for social assistive robots, which can provide uh, some solution to overcome this gap. Uh, there are many different activities where elder care robots can be included. We divide them into activities of daily living, such as feeding, bathing, dressing, IADL instrumental activities, uh, such as getting around, shopping, doing some hop housework, for example, and uh, enhanced activities where it's more uh, leisure time activities, hobbies, and so on. Our philosophy and our experience also on using ro some of these robots, which I won't uh, show today, is that we aim to target activities for social assistive robots only for utilitarian functions. Our experience was that with, if, it, if the robot does not have a functionality, even the older adults will just throw them away. So all the research that I will show you today is really focused on uh, functional uh, robots. Uh, however, when introducing these robots, uh, there are many huge challenges. Uh, first of all, the, the older adults don't really understand or misinterpret these robots. They are, there's a big mismatch of expectations, so they expect much more from the, the robots. And uh, we must be very careful, and I'll show that a bit later, we must be very careful with the level of engagement. We don't want the robots to replace what the elder care should be doing. We want them to be involved. We want them to assist only. So, And you really need to level this out. And of course, you need, to, you need to take into account the acceptance, the trust, ethical consideration, privacy, and safety. And we're very little starting, just starting to deal with all these aspects. All these are emphasized with older adults, okay? So these are aspects that are true for any social robot, but with older adults, this is much emphasized. We focused um, on interaction design. So the work I'll be showing you today is only on interaction design. We took a holistic approach to interaction design, of course, taking the human into account. That's, of course, human-centric design. But, a, and that's from a long experience, in order to do anything in interaction design, you have to test with a multitude of robots, a multitude of tasks, and a multitude of environments. It's not good enough to test one thing with one, a, a, with one type of robot, for example. So what, what you'll see in the different aspects that we developed and investigated, uh, we, inv we included all of these three tasks. So the interaction design takes into account different robots, different tasks, different environments, is tested in different 
with different robots, tasks, and environments. And the holistic approach is that you must take into account the human also. I'll be showing work focused on two main aspects today, focused on transparency. So how do we reflect uh, the intent and aware awareness between the agent, the robot, and the operator? How do we provide the operators with awareness of what the autonomous agent is doing and is its intention to doing? And we develop three different levels of transparency related to the content and information. So you can have a very basic level related only to the perception uh, abilities. You can have also the understanding of what's going on, uh, what the robot is doing, and of course, understanding of the actions, not only what the robot is doing, but why why is it doing it? Uh, and this is based on the situation awareness, uh, trends, the SAT model. Levels of automation or levels of autonomy is very important, especially with older adults. You do not want the robot to take over everything. You want to keep the user engaged, and that is very, very imp important aspect. So we can discuss what degree of level of autonomy. So that's one aspect. So we can go from fully human, the human operates everything, and the robot is just assisting, for example, picking up something very heavy, okay, which the human cannot do. You can have, on the other extent, a robot that is fully autonomous and does everything, cleans the apartment uh, for the older adult without taking into account. And you can have different uh, uh, levels between management by exception, management by consent, and semi-autonomous, where the real human and the robot are working uh, together. Another question in levels of autonomy is who turns the switch? Who decides what is the level of autonomy? Is it the human or the robot? Okay. So we're working on these different aspects and focusing on the interaction only, and I'll get back to that at the end. So the aim was to increase the understanding through feedback, okay? A, and the feedback was based on the level of transparency. The second a, objective was to decide a, and develop different levels of automation and, of course, evaluate them. And again, in the context of older adults, and of course, improve the improve through both of these steps, the quality of interaction uh, by integrating the LOA and the LOT, the level of autonomy and the level of integration. So we had a really a series of research uh, in which the aim was to increase the quality of interaction. And this is a very important aspect and develop a framework to assess the user experience. Uh, and this was, sorry, and this was based on, on one side, feedback about development and evaluation, and on the other side, levels of automation or levels of autonomy and their interaction in between them. And this was done for human, several older adults, different robots, different tasks, and different environments. And this is very, very critical because usually the environment, usually you have studies of these robot developments, you do it in the lab and you infer. But if you're not in a real world setting and if you're not with real users, it's a total different, uh, total different story. Uh, we assessed a whole variety of performance uh, measures, uh, objective measures and subjective measures, uh, engagement, fluency, understanding, comfortability, trust, performance. Okay, so this was assessed uh, using different standard measures uh, in uh, robotics, uh, and using, of course, standard questionnaires in uh, in robotics. Uh, the the feedback development, which was the first step, uh, so we first developed the level of transparency and the feedback content. The content itself is very important. The mode of feedback, how do you do? How do you transfer? Is it visual? Is it auditory? Uh, the timing of feedback, when do you provide the feedback? Do you provide continuous feedback or do you provide it only a discrete element? And uh, how do you evaluate this feedback design? Uh, we conducted this in, in a series and I'll only be showing you some of the studies so one, one study was a person following robot, and we'll see that study later on, in which we designed a robot, robot following the person. And we also did some evaluation on what is the best angle of the robot, because we as users, when we walk with somebody, we walk with somebody by our side, not with somebody following us from behind. So we tried to evaluate this. We did a table setting task uh, where the robot is actually setting the table for the user, a physical exercise, and a telenursing, a robot that is going around the home and, and uh, helping the, the user or the nurse uh, monitor 
uh, hazards, monitor the patients, monitor what's going on in the house. Uh, so we developed a robotic system for physical training uh, in which the robot uh, does uh, exercises tailored for older adults. Uh, basically, we set about five different robots of this in 20 uh, older adults' homes uh, and assessed uh, different uh, aspects of it. So the system was self-designed uh, to do physical exercise that were recommended by health uh, healthcare uh, experts. Uh, in this study, we evaluated 32 participants, older, older adults, so age 70 in the preliminary. Uh, in the, one of our assimilation studies, we also evaluated older uh, adults, uh, and we have a more or less balanced uh, male and females. Uh, and what we did evaluate it, what we did evaluate, we compared two types of robots. So the puppy robot is the robot that we developed, and the now robot is a commercial you see also here, off the shelf robot. We, we compared discrete and continuous timing. We compared audio feedback and audio plus visual feedback. Uh, and this was done in all our studies. So this is the uh, puppy robot, and this is the, the now robot. We focused only on upper limb activities. Uh, so only the upper part uh, was uh, evaluated. Uh, and we evaluated all these different measures, uh, attitude, which is composed of uh, trust, enjoyment, uh, satisfaction, ease of use, and so on. For the type of robot, we compared this also for the type of feedback. So only audio versus both audio and visual uh, feedback. Uh, and again, all these uh, measures. And we also assessed continuous feedback. So do we provide all the time feedback or we just provide discrete, uh, discrete feedback to the user? Uh, and again, so the timing of feedback was also assessed. Uh, and just to give uh, you a summary of the results, uh, so continuous feedback was basically preferred. It provided a more positive attitude, better end understanding, and most importantly, better engagement. The reaction time, of course, was affected, but we're not so concerned about the uh, reaction time. Discrete feedback improved the comfort, comfort, comfort of the uh, of the users, so they were better they better accepted it. The combination uh, of the type of feedback also improved the ease of use, improved the comfort, improved the engagement uh, of the users, uh, and what was most important, and this led us to continue with our studies uh, with the robot that we call Jimmy, uh, is that the at least all our older adults threw away the now. They told us, we don't want this toy. We want a robot that looks like a robot, that we know we're doing, we're working with a robot. And this improved their attitude, their engagement, and their ability to continually uh, train. So this was the robot we went for and we further uh, developed. Uh, the feedback itself was evaluated in additional studies, in a personal following study, in a table setting, as I said, in a telenursing study. Um, so I'll show you if, yeah, we have some time, so if this is running, yeah. So the feedback for the table setting task, uh, we tested what type of feedback is better. Uh, and again, it's a very simple task, but it's a task if somebody has a problem. Uh, so this is all the uh, development. We evaluated here again a light type of feedback uh, for the user. The work user is working together with the older uh, adult uh, and also verbal commands. Okay, so the, the robot itself is telling the user what uh, to do uh, or alerts. Okay, so we also have the alerts and uh, we, we try different levels of complexity also. So, how are older adults uh, influenced by the complexity? And here you can see some of the experiments with older adults. They're really engaged. They really like it. Uh, uh, again, this is a bit, uh, and the robot is slow, okay? The robot is slow. And, and uh, in spite that it is slow, uh, they really are engaged in the task. And I'll show you soon another task where it was really funny to see how people get so much engaged with this stupid robot doing almost nothing. Uh, and just by the fact. Now, there might be a question here on the novelty effect, okay? So I don't know what, what's going to happen 
after this uh, robot is in the home for uh, for 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 a long time. So that that might influence. Uh, so basically, insight from these feedback studies, uh, it's important to convey the information on what the robot is doing. The mode of feedback, definitely you want the combination of visual and voice feedback. And uh, if you want to keep the users aware of what's going on, you need to provide continuous feedback because otherwise you'll lose, uh, you, you'll lose the users. I just want to show you here, I hope, another video in which we developed a robot, a, a robotic system, a game for a cognitive training, okay, with this Pepper uh, robot. And it's a it's a game of uh, glasses, so the we it's like a memory game. You have to uh, when you're finished, you have to touch his hand uh, and or the screen and the so the he's reflecting on the screen the order of the cups, and the older adult has to uh, put the cup in the same way that he shows shows it. If the user is doing well, we'll increase the complexity. Now you can see here, even this young student, how he is engaged and laughing at the robot, depending on the feedback. The feedback is so important. And, you know, he's saying you did a mistake. You can do better. Try again uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, this one says, you know, I want to start dancing. And these are even people that are really professional. So older adults are really, really attracted. And we we discussed before for dementia. This is perfect. I mean, you have this in a station, not at, not at home, and you increase. So she, you did it twice, you did it three times, okay? So now I'll, let's go on to the next level and add another cup. And let's see now if you still do it. Okay, so you're, you're dealing here with both positive and negative feedback. Uh, and when do you give this feedback and how do you give this? So here she, here she did a mistake, let's try it again, okay? And you have to be very careful, again, because you want these people to come back for another training tomorrow and the day after, uh, OK, and here he, she says, OK, you did wrong, but we rely on you that you'll do better uh, the next time. Uh, and this is now OK, the congratulations, you finished the game and you can see the reactions to OK, how how happy they are. Uh, and even, you know, even students that are. Uh, uh, so the feedback is very, very important. Uh, one thing that when we we recognize when, when we were dealing with feedback is that most feedback uh, and there, these are different types of models that are dealing with uh, transparency. So it's not only feedback. Most uh, feedback that was existing uh, was based uh, only on a uh, one type of uh, feedback. So feedback from the robot to the human and was, was lacking the other feedback. And what we really need to create is a tr tr bi-directional feedback. You need feedback from the human to the robot, but you need feedback also from the robot uh, to the human. And therefore we developed the TBA model, the transparency based action model, which basically in addition to robot to human, which that is the regular feedback that was existing to date, we integrate also robot of human and human to robot. So we have continuous feedback between the robot and the human in a bidire bidirectional way. Uh, and we did a series of a, uh, a development on this. So we tried to develop a uh, three levels of transparency, uh, reflecting on the what, why, and the future. However, either because of the novelty effect or because simply it's too complicated, they were not able to differentiate between the three levels, even students. So we just went and decided to work, work only on two levels and we focused only on two levels a, so one in which the robot's actions are independent of the robot's knowledge of the human, and again, in a series of uh, physical exercising systems, and one where it's dependent on the knowledge of the human. So we have bidirectional bi feedback. And the main study was basically based on the technology acceptance model in which we have evaluated a, a for different, the low versus a, the high, a, and each a subject basically performed both of these sessions. A, and a, using the technology acceptance model, we basically evaluate what is preferable. Low TBA, high TBA a, in a series of user studies. And again, all these studies were in the lab a, and that is a limitation. And what we see here in the results, all a, the a, ease of use, the perceived use signal and the attitude were all significantly different with the preferred, with the high, 
the, the orange uh, is preferable by all uh, users. Uh, the success rate and the intention to use is also higher, but was not significantly statistically different between the high, the orange, and the low TBA. Uh, and basically, the results uh, showed us that a high TBA improves the acceptance of the robot, and that's most important. Most of the ro most of the participants like the robot, regardless of the high or the low, and they were willing to uh, integrate with the with the robot and uh, uh, do physical training. Uh, and basically, all the three parts of the relationship were positively cor correlated. Uh, and again, there's a the high TBA is very important, so it's very important to create this bidirectional uh, usability. Uh, another aspect that we dealt with was levels of automation. So how, again, do you decide on what is the level of automation and who decides who turns the switch or who decides if, is it the robot that decides or is it the human that decides that now I want to go on to the uh, high level of automation? And again, this was done in uh, three different tasks, in a table clearing task, in a hazard perception task, which I'll show you, and in a simple collaborative assembly task. Uh, but we also do, uh, change the different uh, variables. So we evaluate this for different task complexities. We evaluated this for different feedback modalities and for different varying uh, workload and complexity uh, levels. And of course, I won't be able to show you all of the results. Uh, but basically what we saw that high level of automation improved the performance, of course, reduced uh, the workload. But we have to remember for older adults, we want to keep the older adults involved. We want to keep them in the loop. We don't want to take from them. We don't want them to give the robot to do everything because then they're not engaged and then they will deteriorate in their uh, in their in their tasks. Uh, so this is for different task complexities. But what we have to see, what what you can see here, is that for the high complexity, which is on the right, uh, there was a reverse trend. So if the task complexity increases, yes, then you want a high, uh, uh, then you want a more, a more, a more automation, more autonomy. If the level of complexity is low, let the user do it. Okay, so you need maybe an adaptable uh, robot. Uh, again, with older adults and uh, hazer perception, so we had this mobile robot, I'll show it to you later, that is roaming around uh, and the robot is, uh, so we, we link the level of automation with the level of transparency. So it has to be linked. You can't differentiate these uh, separately. And we basically develop the level of autonomy uh, based on the different stages in the task. So we defined, again, only two levels, a low level and a high level of autonomy uh, based on the... Uh, so this is robot alone, this is human alone, and these are two different medium levels. A, where the human interacts, is able to interact with the robot. And this is done both for acquisition of information, processing the information, making the decision, and the actual action, actions. Because for each of these, you can have these different levels, and you can't give the user too many options a, to select from. That's too complicated. A, and in addition, you need to deal with the level of transparency. Okay, so again, no information at the perception level, at the comprehension level, and at the action level, you do the combination. And again, we used only two levels, high and low. And again, this was done for a mobile robot task, a person following task, for the table setting task, and for a teleoperated robot. I'll give you, I'll show you the video of the person following robot, which is really neat. So it's a robot, and we discussed before that the, the robot is simply carrying, for example, something, carrying a heavy grocery, a, or just helping uh, the robot, helping the person, and you can see how the user gets engaged. So here, the robot is able to detect the person and of course follow the person. Okay, so we had to implement. Now, you can see at the beginning, the person is uncertain what's going on. He doesn't understand what the robot is doing, and that's not good. So you need to improve feedback. You need level of automation, and here's improvements, and here he's, he's going now very confident, very safely. And the robot is, of course, telling you, I'm following you, I'm following you, I'm following you. You don't need to look back, and then you'll trip when you're going uh, when you're going so forward. So we implemented, again, the mode of feedback, the timing of feedback, and the evaluation of this. Uh, we had different levels of autonomy that were integrated. Uh, and this is just some of the evaluation results. Uh, so the users were having fun, okay? 
and the users really, you know, engagement and engagement is critical with older adults. It's very important. And it's very important understanding. Okay. So we're now dealing a whole bunch of research leading to understanding. And as I mentioned, a utilitarian functioning. So the robot is not just following me. It's following me for some type of function. And here he's just uh, having fun with the robot and playing. So uh, if you increase the LOA and you have feedback, you can really increase uh, the engagement. Um, yeah, so, and this was done on and shown also for the table setting task. So again, it's very important not to evaluate this in a synthetic standalone study. If you want to really do anything, you have to evaluate it really in a series of studies with a seri series of users, because otherwise uh, the conclusions are very, very, very limited. And even here, I'll soon state and finalize and show that it's, uh, it's, it is very uh, limited. So when possible, operate the robot at a low level of auto autonomy to keep the user engaged, okay? And this is especially true with older adults. A, and combining a low level of autonomy with a high level of transparency helps keep the older adults. Now, this might be different for children. This might be different with other users. But the older adult needs a high level of transparency in order to understand what's going on. And we're dealing now and trying to develop work related to understandability. And how do you make a, the user understand what the robot is doing and vice a, versa? Uh, in situations of urgency, high LOA, of course, is uh, may be used and should be used probably. Um, and yes, you have to really do personalization and adaption. So the level of autom autonomy, the level of transparency has to be adapted to the user, to the task, to the robot, uh, and so on. And I'll show you here one of our studies with the tele operated robot, which was oh, or not. OK. OK. So this is a users operating remotely the robot to transfer around uh, different places in the house. Uh, for hazard deception to see if there's a cable that the older adult might fall across or a table in his uh, obstruction. Uh, so this is the interface that we designed. And of course, the interface by itself, without the feedback even, is very, very uh, important. And here the user is basically operating the robot. So you're in the living room, go, go, go to the bedroom, uh, and you evaluate how does the types of feedback, how is, does the interface design influence what user is able to do and of course different users uh, and this is very very important so the main contributions of the research was uh, that you need to automate the transparency and you need to take into account the levels of uh, transparency you need to develop feedback and again there's a lot of work that is needed in all this interaction design loa models should be developed and should be tailored designed to the task, to the robot, to the user. You need to integrate these models. And as I mentioned, the transparency-based action model proved very, very uh, important. We have ongoing research related to other aspects, how to increase the understanding of robots, how to make these robots a bit polite also, and not just functional. And how do you evaluate these robots a long time because yes we did take a holistic approach but we were very limited in our studies we were very limited we, we focused only on the interaction design in all these studies and it's a long series of studies uh, and this is only a bit forward and that's why we're not there yet with social robots we're very far away okay so yes we took a holistic approach but this is not enough so we're here at the technology we proved the technology we developed the technology okay we did a bit, a bit, in all the studies, we did acceptance. You, we use the technology acceptance model. You can use other models. Uh, but, and this is the current practice in all HRI studies. Very few, you can count it probably on one hand, how many studies did dealt with assimilation a long time and, and adoption, I don't think, any studies. And this is critical, 
OK, because if we want to see robots penetrate into market, you need to deal also with assimilation. And we're only at the acceptance level. That's the maximum we're dealing with and also very limited. Most HRI studies and there's a, a call now out in the HRI field. We accept only papers that have been done, not in the lab. We want field studies. This is critical because any otherwise any of your research is is really very, very limited. And I'm saying the acceptance is not enough. You need the three A's. You need acceptance, assimilation, and adoption. Okay, and we're just at the development. What I showed you is development and the start of acceptance. Very limited. Now, in order to get to technology adoption, I didn't talk of any of these aspects, okay? And you need to deal with it. Safety, of course. Legal, of course. The ethical issue. So we're dealing with the usability and the acceptance, but the ethical issues, the logistics. Okay, do you provide these robots as a service? Do you provide these robots? Do you sell these robots? Who will buy these robots? How do you develop the whole system? And just to give you one aspect, sorry, one aspect from here, the social aspects, eh, there's an influence. If I develop a robot for Japan, it will be totally different than a robot for Europe. And I need to take this into account. And you can only take this into account in, in user studies. Age and gender influences the technical background influences, okay? And you need to take all this in account. And, and if I just give an example of what I showed you in the development, just the feedback and the level of autonomy, but there's other issues, there's the design, uh, there's the functionality. Uh, so we're very, very, very far away from getting these robots, also these robots into, into market. Uh, so thanks a lot. I apologize that I will really have to run after I finish. There's been a lot of collaborations. Part of most of this work was part of the Socrates uh, project, EU project, and there was a lot of co collaboration uh, with other uh, faculty and universities uh, abroad. And of course, my dear students who are all out in industry and working uh, not on robots, unfortunately, but on good stuff. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm open for some short questions. Thank you for this very interesting talk. And uh, there are questions. Questions? OK, maybe we can start from the. Uh, just a short precision. You said that some elderly thought about uh, uh, rejecting uh, robots that look like toy or they, they wanted like real robot. Can you say a bit more about this? What is the difference between a toy and a robot, let's say? Yes, they, they, they the older adults. Well, they were different, and we also have a study of assimilation along the long time in which we gave these robots to 19 older adults. Each one had over around six weeks in their home, and they activated it alone. Um, the older adults, oh, sorry, okay, sorry. The older adults did not like what what we got. What we got from most of them is that they. I don't want to, I'm not a child. I don't play with robot. If I want a robot that is doing for me physical training, I want it to look like a robot. So they threw away the kind of the now robot, which is a charming robot, okay? It's very charming. But they said, no, this is not for me. Another reaction we got is, and these are from people that are 80, 85, 90. I mean, our older, our oldest person that experienced with the robot was 97, okay? And she enjoyed the robot a lot. A, one of the comments that we got, okay, bring me these robots when I'm older, when I need it, okay? Uh, so they want the, at least so the population that we tested with, okay? And it, it, will, it will differ depending on culture, I'm sure. They want the robot to look like a robot. They want to know it's a robot. Oh, yeah. I, I do agree. I, there will be cultural differences, but I think uh, in general we treat our adults. There is this um, kind of uh, infantilization of older adults and they are rejecting that. And that's also why you need to be careful with a, a, a toy like appearance, because then you do not take them seriously. Uh, and so that's also something that plays, I think, uh, why you need to be careful. Otherwise, they are enchanted, so they they some playfulness is okay as long as you do not yeah like belittle them so that's a a, a difficult trade-off okay another question 
thank you for the very nice presentation. Uh, <clears throat> my question is related to the to the feedback level because you said that delivering continuous feedback uh, provided the best results. But what about uh, um, cognitive effort? Because I guess that processing continuous feedback might be overwhelming in the long run. Uh, what well, can you comment so on that? It probably depends on the task complexity. Okay. So the, the task complexity, if it's not too complex, they want to know what's going on, the older adults. And you but but when you're providing this continuity, it's like LEDs that are lit in. So you don't you're not in few you're not forcing. Now maybe auditory might be too much for them. Okay. And now we had with our Jimmy with the physical trainer. We also, of course, since we were really dealing with older adults, so we had, of course, impairments. So some of the older adults couldn't see, some couldn't hear. And so that's another issue. So you really have to do personalization and adaption. Okay, just just a, a, as a side uh, question, um, do you uh, test also? Did you think of testing also other types of feedback, for example, vibrotactile or something different than uh, uh, visual or auditory? So stimulating them uh, in some other way? We didn't. We did not. There was research in our group that has done uh, work on uh, on tactile. Which gave ni nice, nice results. But here, since we're doing a human-robot collaborative task, so they need to see the robot and interact with you're anyway looking at the robot. But in other tests, definitely, can send you the references. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, great, great talk. Um, regarding the who turns the switch on the level of autonomy, you rightly said it needs to be adaptive to the user and the task, but the user themselves can change. Like if a user starts very controlling uh, on the robot, maybe may desire later on a less uh, control and more autonomy, like this dance. Do you, do you? Yes, that's, you have... you're totally right. Yeah. Uh, and this, so that's why it has to be adaptive. So you have to enable this adaptivity. Even though we did assimilation studies, I'm not, so there, in all the lab, Experiments, there is a big influence of the novelty effect, the, especially with older adults, but also with students. They're so absorbed in the robot that, you know, this is new for them. So, and in some of our studies, we try to take users that were already familiar with the robot just to get this out a bit, but they do get used to the robot a long time. And then definitely, that's why we, we have this enabled in all in all the interfaces because users will change a long time they're learning the technology and they will want to change definitely other questions from the room if not there is a question from teams i will read it so hello this is sharat from profactor austria thank you very much for the interesting talk it was very informative Perhaps this was covered in uh, in your talk, but I was a bit delayed to join the talk. When about uh, adaptive feedback, do you consider the experience level, expertise level of the user when providing feedback? Uh, perhaps some users would like to have more continuous feedback and some of them more discrete. How could you these uh, aspects be integrated into the system? So definitely, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, you do need to develop personalized and adaptive feedback and autonomy, both. And this, of course, can be done. You need That's why you need the bi-directional communication and not only the feedback. So you need to understand also what the human wants. You can have the human set. You can have the robot decide when to switch. It cannot switch too frequently because then you're driving the user crazy. Uh, so you have to be careful when you switch, uh, but definitely the way to go is personalized and adaptive feedback. Okay, so there are other questions. If not, uh, I would like to and thank again the I have to professor yeah, Ledan for the speak for the speech, and uh, we uh, have a small break of fifteen minutes. Yeah, so we will back soon.